Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fourth and final Startups for Sea Change panel. Uh, we are excited to have both the Lasso and Clean Coast Innovations, who's one of our co-created startups. Uh, but I figured before, uh, before we jump in, I always love to give kind of the update as we've been navigating the second and now going into third and final month of our cohort. Uh, you know, we're looking at now officially the end of cohort event being on October 20th here in Miami. Uh, venue to be announced, but we're working hard on the logistics, which on top of 10 startups is just so much fun to coordinate. But more importantly, you know, what we've really gotten to see is just all of our startups really hitting their stride with, as you'll hear today, our second co-created startup, Clean Coast, really solidifying some of the work that they're working towards. And beyond that, you know, I'm just really proud to say that we're less than a month away. And I can confidently say that everybody here has been getting some real value out of the experience and that we've strongly made our case for sticking around for both Miami and the overall blue economy. So just to recap how we uh, do things in case you haven't made our previous panels, you know, basically what we're gonna do is we're just gonna have each of these startups introduce a little bit about what they're working on, maybe either run you through their deck or just do a brief overview of the work they've done so far. And then we'll go into some predetermined questions for about, I would say 20 minutes or so. And then for the last 15 minutes or so, we'll have an open Q&A. So you can put your questions in the chat and we'll have the startups answer them at the end and you'll be able to unmute to answer your questions. So with all that being said, I will throw it to Salasso to kick us off and introduce us to what they're working on. And I will make sure you guys have the ability to share your screen to do so. There you go. Thank you, Daniel. I think through the, uh, we'll share, share the screen. Yes. And, yeah. So it first should all, be visible. Do you do you see it? Yeah. I do. Looks good. Double check. Fantastic. Okay. And first of all, a little introduction. I am Paulina Sanella, co-founder of Talasso. I am a seaweed nerd and an ocean advocate. And uh, through yes. <laughs> I'm through the Sunstaba sitting in Norway. It's late over here, uh, almost midnight. But you know, I'm excited to uh, present a little bit about our project. So we're going to get started with it. So Talasso is a Mexican region corporation with a circular blue economy approach. And our main objective is to harvest sargasso. This is an invasive seaweed that is threatening the Caribbean region. And we turn this hazard into an opportunity through autonomous harvesting drones that can be operate from the beach or anywhere in the world. And a network of microbio refineries at which turn this seaweed into several products that will improve our planet's health. Uh, climate change caused an unprecedented blooming of sargasso. 20 million tons of this seaweed is drifting around the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic. And to put it into perspective, the size that it covers equals the size of the United States. So it's massive. Uh, of course, it threatens the economies, livelihoods, the ecosystems by invading the beach, killing marine life and destroying all the businesses. And for you to understand a little bit better, the one that are not familiar with the problem, this is a beach in Barbados in a very nice hotel uh, before the presence of Sarayaso. And this is the same beach now with the, during Sarayaso season. So we have developed a unique solution with the latest in autonomous aquatic technology. We will make sure to deliver a harvesting robot that is environmental and electric, can take on rough water conditions, can be remotely controlled and do not need a crew. It's economically sound, can take on necessary capacity, and it's easily scalable. And to deliver a holistic solution to this challenge, we have piloted a microbio refinery in Mexico that can be established and replicated in very short periods of time in the affected countries. Uh, this seaweed is super valuable and it's possible and products are many. We believe seaweeds play a significant role in solving many of global challenges, or as we like to say, we believe seaweed will save the world. And here are just some of the maybe most important uh, end products. One, Fucoidan, which is a super powerful antiviral alginate that is a raw material that can be used to make bioplastics and uh, a substitute for fabrics for fashion industry. Kettle supplement that can reduce the meth methane emissions uh, up to 84%, biofertilizers, and so much more. 
And our solution uh, is available for all countries, uh, hotels, marinas, and ports, including the ones with less flexible economies. The result will improve the ecosystem, the livelihoods for locals, making sure the coastlines are clear. Uh, we, cre we can create local jobs and potentially a large new economy while supporting the Caribbean governments in achieving several of the sustainable development goals. A strong team is a key to success. Uh, so here a little bit, uh, Frude and Paulina, me, we're professionals in international relations with experience and knowledge in water, marine ecosystem management, social impact, nonprofit organizations, and government affairs. And our advisors have many years of experience within ocean economy, international business, and blue technology. Our target market begins in the Caribbean region, Mexico and the United States with the opportunity to expand to West Africa. Hotels, marinas, ports, governments are all suffering from sargasso invasion and have the need for accessible solutions to keep the coastline clean. We will have many tons of biomass available so the microbio refineries can transform this biomass into endless number of products with a high value for pharmaceutical, cosmetic, food and other industries. One of our, our focuses has been to build a solid and strong network with partners and potential clients. Um, as you see now, we, we are members of Ocean Autonomy Cluster and NOSCA in Norway, Bloom Cluster in Barbados, and also Venture Studio in Miami that you all know, uh, Seaworthy Collective. Um, yep. <laughs> And we offer a service where we harvest and charge per linear meter of beach clean. This has been done by both governments and hotels on yearly contract basis. We can also license the harvesters to local operating partners um, and we can transform the biomass into multiple high value products. And that is the lasso, thank you. Thank you so much, Paulina. And I do want to give for a thank you for burning the midnight oil to stay up for this panel. So uh, <laughs> with that, I'd love to throw it to Clean Coast with Dr. Abby Engelman and Bo Andrews. Do you want to talk a little bit about what we've been working on? Sure. Hello, I'm Dr. Abby Engelman. I'm a ecologist and marine scientist currently working in policy. And just to give you a little bit of background, I joined the team very recently and we really hit the ground running. Um, but to set the stage, we're at a really interesting time where we have concurrent environmental problems and ultimately it comes down to pollution and transparency and reporting. So with climate change, I'm sure you guys are all familiar, um, but we're releasing far too much CO2 into the atmosphere and a recent report by the UN states that unfortunately, we are only on target to reach 12% of the emissions reduction that we need to address our climate disasters. In addition to that, we require fundamental data to understand how we are polluting our coastlines, our environment, and also tracking how we are scaling up and addressing our climate disasters through the solutions that we provide. Um, on the transparency and reporting side, we have a really exciting opportunity to get involved with ESG and sustainable impact reporting because um, there's increasing awareness of how, uh, how non-descriptive ESG reporting metrics are and how there's immense opportunity to combine ESG and reporting metrics with the actual academic and scientific data. So our technology and our solution is to deploy and autonomous sensor packages that are deployed in networks that can provide an objective way to quantify ocean investment impacts by focusing on nearshore water monitoring. And those would be deployed in an integrated suite of autonomous sensors and provide a objective mechanism for providing environmental data on carbon sequestration, nutrient runoff and pollution, and allow us to translate that into metrics that actually mean something tangible to the people, the companies, and the societies that they serve. Bo, would you like to touch on the social applications? Yeah, thanks, uh, everybody. Hey, everybody, I'm Bo. Um, yeah, so just piggybacking off there and kind of fin uh, finishing the flow, 
what can we do with this information? How does this impact outside of those direct communities, those direct markets? And so we want to take this and make it um, accessible to the average individual and have that citizen science approach. And so getting people involved, having them part of it for collecting the data, understanding the data um, within ESG um, funding as well. And there's just a lot of applications that we can take outside of the directly um, impacted communities and bring in just so many more elements that ultimately bridge the gap between the average individual that's seeing this, you know, they walk outside and they see some kind of impact and the, the companies or the organizations that are directly impacting and are being impacted by it. So bridging that gap and having this collective community is what we're hoping to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Well, and to me, it's really this beautiful thing where, you know, obviously we're doing community building here at Seaworthy, but we can use technology to actually enable community building as well. And I think it's just this amazing application, especially for South Florida, where we can quantify problems like red tide and algal blooms and, and climate change. And it's really a question of, you know, just how many different platforms we can put these things on. So it's really exciting. And uh, to Abby's point, you know, Abby only joined us in the last few weeks, but we have absolutely hit the ground running and uh, we're excited to be able to share more as we get toward the end of the cohort. So keep an eye out for these guys. But in the meantime, one thing I wanted to share before we jump into our predetermined questions is a little bit about kind of the interdisciplinarity of these two startups. You know, we've talked, we've called this panel the, you know, revolving around pollution detection and removal and alternatives. But equally, they're also working on the, on the fringes of ocean data and technology and emerging innovation. And so, you know, when we look at the verticals that we have and overall the development of solutions in our space, it's very rare that solutions are only siloed to one vertical, right? The whole point is that there should always be overlap because that interdisciplinary approach is really what enables us to solve these problems on a multifaceted level and not just have one problem, one solution. And there's, as we know, so many problems that we need to solve. So that's one of the key things I love as we kind of are going to approach these questions is really hitting on these, this interdisciplinary perspective of saying, you know, from both of these different angles, how are these startups really working to solve the big problems facing our ocean? So with that, I'm going to jump into our question. And my first question, I'll throw back to Paulina and Freude, which is, how do you see pollution detection and removal and or ocean data technology and emerging innovations evolving as a blue tech sector? Well, first of all, one thing that uh, we have seen quite a lot of is uh, these, uh, you know, there's a booming of, of underwater drones and so on. Uh, you will see that, especially, you know, I'm a Norwegian and we see that, you know, there's been a lot of uh, issues around, uh, you know, fish farming and other things. And, uh, and um, now uh, it's become very important to measure the quality of the water, even with the air, uh, of the air and all that stuff. And in Norway, we have some startups that are working with uh, underwater or uh, aqua drones. And, and they're popping up other places as well. I think there's a startup over in, you know, Barbados in Norway, I think over in the US as well. So, so definitely um, uh, measuring water using sensors and so on, I, it's, it's, a big, it's a big boom of that and a lot of interest. Polina, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I love the answer. <laughs> awesome. Bill <laughs> Abby? Sure, I, it's, it's an incredibly exciting time. You hear that we know more about Mars and our solar system and the moon than we do about our ocean because it's absolutely true. We've been quite limited on the tech front of what we can understand about our ocean. And because of that, the oceans are incredibly under-recognized as a major solution to climate change. Like they absorb 90% of the excess heat in the atmosphere, over 30% of the excess CO2 yet they're often left out because what's out of sight is out of mind. So as we're starting to recognize that our impacts on our planet and society are limited by the, the boundaries that our planet sets, it requires us to dive in for lack of a really bad pun, but we need to dive in and take note of what we have in the ocean, monitor what impacts we're having on it because as much as we like to believe it, our planet isn't as vast and limitless as we think. And um, yeah, it just presents tremendous opportunity for this rapidly evolving blue tech sector as 
the next frontier. For the record here at Seaworthy, we very much endorse that pun. Um, <laughs> all that being said, uh, great, great insights on both sides. Thank you guys. Uh, actually, Bo, sorry, did you have anything you wanted to add as well? Uh, just kind of echo that and just because there's so much that's unknown, just taking that and um, connecting the just the common individuals to be able to understand that even better. And that's kind of, I think, what we're trying to do here. And again, like I said, just bridge that gap between all of this. I love that. And I think one of the things that you guys have heard me say uh, at least a few times by now is making the unknowns known, right? The sooner that we can make this information something that people can actually interpret and understand at a basic level, right? It sounds overwhelming when you're like, well, what's the, you know, partial, uh, concentration of CO2 in the water, right? Or nitrates and phosphates. And how does that all relate to the fact that we're having fish killed? But when we can actually start to create data and make, you know, very, I would say just, you know, simple understandings of what this data actually re results in in real life and it's not just overwhelming numbers in chemistry, it makes it a lot easier to translate our anthropogenic impact and what we can do to fix it. So great points. Um, I will throw it back to you guys at Clean Coast here. So what are some of the benefits of your technologies beyond just building and addressing marine pollution? You know, thinking about just the broader scope, I think, Bo, you were starting to touch on the social aspects. I want to maybe dive in a little, little deeper on that. Yeah, so um, just because there isn't like a, a set standard really to, to this and there isn't a, a massive amount of applicable understanding that within the citizen science approach, you can connect with universities for greater education. You can connect with individuals um, because we are wanting to make more of a mobile data pack. So you can have individuals that are out kayaking or paddle boarding and they're collecting data. They're in helping impact um, in, with ESG and the increase in funding. Uh, there's individual, there's other ways for individuals to get in. And so kind of creating that hub, there's a lot of channels if we do this properly where the average individual can come in and have that sense of collaboration and helping to partner with this. Um, and so that's kind of that approach. I'll kind of throw it off to, or hand it off to Abby to how the impact uh, with more of the science approach. Sure. Um, like Bo mentioned, it's all about collecting data and not only having those numbers, but translating it and making them societally applicable which is the most exciting thing about this because for so long we've had different silos like scientists stayed in their lane, uh, the finance sector stayed in their domain, business was in the same um, or in their own silo as well. But now we get to translate it and say, okay, this is how our actions make a difference for the planet, whether it's good or bad and also um, allow us to monitor the ecosystems that we depend on. So not only has the ocean been buffering so much of our impact on the planet thus far, but that ability to buffer our CO2 emissions is very limited. And we're also destroying ecosystems that are providing the ecosystem services that we depend on. So being able to monitor that and track that gives us immense power to actually curb the, the path that we're on, hopefully, and provide a better outcome so that we can maintain the ecosystems that are providing these services while also connecting people to the impact they have on the planet. Awesome. Paulina and Freud, anything you'd like to add on your end? Yeah, for sure. So um, as you mentioned, the, so, the social impact, uh, they, they potentially help in creating resilient, sustainable coastal communities. Uh, like uh, this is this is very interesting because Caribbean uh, countries we and Mexico we don't have a culture within seaweeds so this is why we're currently treating this seaweed that is arriving as garbage when that is not the case at all even though it is damaging the ecosystem and the businesses and so on if we manage it correctly then we can create actually we can trigger a new economy in the region that is much more sustainable than uh, tourism. And that's the case in most of these uh, affected countries. Um, they depend solely on tourism and a little bit in fishing. So, so now with this invasion and then with COVID, they realize that uh, having an economy based solely on tourism, well, it's very complicated. 
And also, of course, it's very exciting to start working and getting to know Sargasso, this amazing seaweed, because of all the applications, right? Uh, that we are working together with other companies to develop fabrics, to develop uh, bioplastic, then the impact gets bigger and bigger. Uh, even for human health, we are running some tests with uh, Fucoidan, which is an extraction from Sariaso on infected cells of COVID. So it can even impact health like worldwide. So it's very amazing like how, how everything starts getting connected. Yeah, you don't leave much for me to say, but I'm try, gonna try to add a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, it, it's very important for us to have this holistic and circular approach. You know, when you're picking up all this sargassum and you save, you know, maybe some beaches, and you know, uh, the the purpose of our job is basically to to uh, to to remove it. But you know, you could do one thing, and it's you save the beach, and then you ruin the land because it's full of heavy metals and all that stuff. So you move the problem into land, and then you have another issue. So um, for us, it's very important that um, you know we see you know the next steps of it, and, and we create this circular circular idea around it. And that's why we are you know this garbage, as they call it, this is, is basically our gold. <laughs> and um, and um, you know we can create a, a bunch of additional products from it um and even some very valuable ones so so in the reality we can use the whole biomass and we can leave uh nothing behind um but uh and also a very interesting thing is uh you know this is sargassum in itself uh even though we want to uh you know keep the the beaches clean and so on it uh, out there in the ocean where it doesn't really you know it's not in the way for for for, for anything it actually works like a massive forest so it's actually um it's actually um how do you say absorbing a lot of the co2 and actually you know the the the, the ocean it responds to the pollution everything is happening so they have their saving mechanism in order to 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 get cleaner and sargassum is is one of those mechanisms they're using but anyway, that was a little, I went a little to the side of your question, but anyway, I just wanted to have something to say because Paulina said it all, you know? <laughs> um, well, I was gonna say, you actually did a perfect lead into my next question and I was gonna have you expand on what you just said. So okay. uh, I'm gonna throw it back at you for it. Um, so, you know, you, well, I'm gonna add a little bit to this question for you specifically, but clean coat, don't worry. Um, so in explaining a little bit, maybe about the circular economy for people who don't know, you know, at Seaworthy, we talk about building systems of solutions that work together synergistically to build regenerative blue economies. And I know you guys have a very two-pronged approach within your own company, let alone working with others. So, you know, I think this is a great opportunity to explain, you know, both within Thalasso, specifically for you guys, what the two-pronged approach is and how that builds circular economies. And then, again, working with some of the outlying solutions that could actually work with you guys in, in coordination. Cool. Was that a lead for me further on? Or? Yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, so, okay. sorry, I did. Yeah, well, well, anyway. Yeah, great comment. And um, um, yeah, I mean, like for, for, for further working and to see how we can actually use the, uh, you know, our harvester further on. Uh, of course, um, you know, our focus or how we uh, adopt the technology at the current moment, we are we're focusing on this orgasm. But of course, you have plastic out there. You have also uh, oil spill and so on. And, you know, you can definitely adapt the solutions in order to perhaps, you know, work more as an oil skimmer and also to, 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 to focus more on the plastic waste and so on that is out there. Pauline, you want to expand on that? All good? Yeah. Okay, so Clean Coast, I won't have you explain circular economies, don't worry. But Cohen Abbey, just, you know, again, talking about the systems approach, how, how does the technology you're working on, and, and again, even the social component, tie in with some of these other solutions that we see emerging? Sure, so as I touched on briefly before, basically as these blue tech companies are evolving and also natural asset companies or companies that are uh, putting a financial value on our natural ecosystems through natural capital, we need to be monitoring their impact. So of course, it's wonderful to have this new frontier of technologies emerging. Uh, but when it comes down to it, the biggest 
gap and issue we have with ESG investing and impact um, is measuring and quantifying our impact. So as these are emerging, we need to ensure that they're um, that we're able to monitor the impact so that we can promote these ecosystems and these ecosystem services. So our technology can easily be applied to numerous companies um, like a kelp farm or integrated into different seawall ecosystems. Those are some of the other startups that we see at Seaworthy Collective. They could be collecting data that's applicable to um, AI integration or digital twins so that we have this underwater real-time data monitoring of our ecosystems. Awesome. Bo, did you have anything you wanted to add as well? Um, yeah, kind of just that piece you mentioned, making the unknown known and kind of how we can kind of connect all this um, within ESG and the valuation and the monitoring of NACs, it's all uncharted. Um, and so taking all of this, there's a lot of unregulated aspects and everything that's going on within these spaces. And so if we can help eliminate or decrease that as much as we can with what we're providing, that um, kind of allows us to connect that in that piece and making this more of a, a valid continual solution. Yeah, and I think it's it really interesting and I'm definitely not gonna make anyone go down the blockchain rabbit hole too deeply, but you know when we talk about these emerging systems for accountability and traceability, um, I mean, it starts with the data, but also something making something immutable, but I'm not going to go too far down that, but I think it's a really interesting <laughs> layer that could be integrated on top of it all. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Salasso for the next question. And this is really, you know, so we talk about now, we've talked about kind of how these solutions create systems. And then basically from there, you know, the, what we like to say at Seaworthy is basically that these systems of solutions themselves are actually scalable, right? These are regenerative blue economies on a local scale. And so basically our question is, how do you see your solution and these systems of solutions scaling to drive broader ocean and climate impact? Pulling in for you? Yes, well, um, um, I think it, with regards to this point, the microbio refineries. So um, seaweed is an amazing raw material as we mentioned before. But there's a big challenge and it's not only happening in the Caribbean, but in the rest of the world, like the farmers, they, they struggle a lot or spend a lot of money sending the biomass to other bio refineries that are massive. So uh, what we have been trying to do with uh, Talasso is a, what we call a more democratic approach, meaning uh, we are trying to find a solution that can be uh, replicated and scaled in several countries. And I mean, very specifically talking about sargassum, the microbio refineries can be established in three months. So then you can take care of the emergency, but also start creating an economy, creating jobs and so on. And the interesting, one of the interesting things uh, is that a lot of seaweed farms, especially the ones that uh, are dealing with uh, brown seaweed, like sargassum, kelp and so on, and they have been interested in this model because again, then you empower the seaweed farmers to extract their own high value ingredients and then they, they will have a more healthy business and so on. Yeah, and um, you know, the sorghasm is a natural disaster in itself, you know, so just by removing it, of course, you, you know, to, to, to uh, affect the climate impact and so on, uh, when it comes to shore, it kills the uh, you know, it, it changes the, the marine life, it kills the marine life, it kills uh, uh, the um, coral reefs and so on, you know, it comes to the beach, it, uh, you know, uh, it, it increases the temperature uh, in the beach and so on. So, you know, the turtle eggs are boiling. And so basically just by removing it in itself, and since this, this is an issue that is affecting probably 20 plus countries in the Caribbean, um, at least dramatically reduce it or 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 remove it from 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 the coastlines uh will will definitely uh, solve the uh how do you say like the attack that is basically happened with sargassum these days oh really great points and, and i love to say it's like integrated solutions you know that it's it's not just about catching it on on the you know when it's actually in the water but even actually being pro proactive and reactive combined 
So great point there. Yeah, and, and one last thing, Daniel. I mean, right now we're focusing on the harvesting and on the biorefining. But uh, uh, in the presentation, we have a slide and it's very important, very important when we talk about that holistic approach is because we know we need a proper forecasting and monitoring system in place, then we need to harvest, then we need to process, then we need to regenerate the damage that it has already caused. And for this matter, of course, we cannot do everything, but we are we are finding partners and creating these systems or communities to be able to to take care of the whole value chain. Beautifully said. Um, at the end though, same question for you guys. How do you see your technology and the systems of solutions really scaling? Sure, so ultimately what it comes down to, as I, I mentioned a little bit, is transparency and reporting. We as humans love to set goals. It makes us feel good, but how successful are we at actually attaining those goals? And um, as the UN has noted, governments are declaring goals that they're not on track to meet. Um, we have ecosystem restoration, which I personally have a lot of research experience in. The biggest limitation there is we conduct research or restoration projects without the long-term monitoring needed to understand the impacts uh, long-term and more sustainable as solutions with longevity and ESG and um, sustainability impact reporting, we don't have tangible data that's actually as meaningful as it could be. So what our solution provides is not only hard data and monitoring, but also takes it a step further to translate this into valuation for our ocean and our ecosystems because on top of that, we have uh, ecosystem valuation, which has historically been done using proxy systems like uh, remote sensing data, which is wonderful. It's a great technological advancement, um, but we provide the localized and long-term real-time data that's needed to actually understand the specifics of um, nearshore ecosystems. So anything else you like to add to that? Um, yeah, and kind of just how the scalability uh, within the social act, uh, aspect, um, there's our culture is shifting and individuals are wanting to spend more time on experiences, uh, more time out and just seeing um, a positive impact. And so that as that awareness increases, that allows us to be able to can provide that um, connection. And so there is that element as a culture is shifting and that will increase, um, that allows us to have that aspect and the scalability within the social impact. Yeah, and I think citizen science too, as a you know, scalability tool, it's really interesting because I think we're seeing, especially with how accessible doing science on our phones is, right, through an app, for example, right? Like it's no longer this barrier to where you need to train people on technology. A lot of people have the basic technical skills to be able to help aid citizen science and make something a lot more scalable technically than we ever been able to in the past. So great points. Um, I'm gonna throw to our last question. So again, if you still have a question you haven't put it in the chat, this is your last chance. So make sure to do it. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to Paulina and Freude. And the question is, what advice do you have for current and aspiring blue and climate tech entrepreneurs looking to fight pollution and climate change with innovation? Well, first of all, um, if you have an idea, you know, I think, um, talk talk with people uh and especially i mean like for us it's been very sex successful to go through you know talk with accelerators and inc incubators um test your idea with people who know the field and you know start with see where the collective that's been very good for us you know <laughs> and put it out there and uh um yeah but you know there are there are many out there for of course but for, if you do you know for instance ocean environment and so on find an incubator that that knows a lot about that and in addition to that i think it's also um, something that maybe people think it's uh, far-fetched but uh you know the bigger organizations are very interesting to listening to what you're doing so don't be afraid of contacting them you know present your ideas and and so on and they have a lot of like little divisions that focuses on you know smaller companies and startups, early stage businesses, and so on. And they will they will try out your idea and even put you in you know 
conversations with with people that uh, that can do something for you. So I guess, yeah, there's a couple of things. <laughs> Alina. Yeah. Uh, well, um, first and most important thing, uh, the future of humankind relies on a healthy ocean. So go for it. Like, don't hesitate. Uh, it's worth every single drop of sweat uh, because it, it can get tough sometimes, but it's absolutely worth it. Um, and as Prude said, like, um, it, we're very lucky. Ocean and seaweed uh, ecosystems are kind of small and are super friendly. And most of people is willing to help you, to mentor you, to make introductions, even when with their own investors and so on. So don't be afraid, reach out. You already have the know, so you might as well. And, and we're working together to improve planet's health. So that's it. Abby and Bell? Not to get philosophical, but the oceans are something that all of humankind shares. It's something we all have in common. And um, just like the oceans have no borders, it's something that we need to break down these silos that we've put ourselves in because we really need all hands on deck and everyone addressing it together. Um, so regardless of what discipline you come from, there's plenty of room for you. And um, we need you, the ocean needs you. and bring a scientist along because it also needs to be science driven. Great point. And last but not least, Bo? Yeah, I kind of echo what has been said, but there's just such a great need and there's so many facets um, that need to be fulfilled within that need. And so kind of like what um, Abby just said, whatever your skill or your trade or your talent or your passion is, there's a way to plug that in to help fill this need to create a, a positive impact that really is globally that we need to share collectively. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. And I think I love to actually quote uh, the Jacques Cousteau quote. It's like the oceans are the great unifier, right? And I mean, we're seeing it even here just as far as even politically that it brings the other people who are either more driven by ROI versus people who really care about impact. And that I think is one of the beautiful opportunities as well. Speaking of beautiful opportunities, this is now the time for people to get to ask their questions. So I'm gonna making sure I know a couple of people had to drop off, but Mariana, would you like to unmute to ask your question? Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me? I think I am yes. muted. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I asked earlier, uh, just curious about um, what Polina presented before uh, about the uh, what can be produced, what kind of products can be produced from sargassum. Yes, thank you. So there are several products and uh, the ones that we're currently extracting are the, the ones that I mentioned, Fukuidan. Fukuidan is a very used supplement uh, mainly in Japan and in uh, the US as well. And this is to boost the immune system. Uh, it's an uh, anti-clogging. Uh, it helps with inflammation and many other purposes. Then the second one that we're using is Fukuxantin. This one is, uh, it's being tested to treat Alzheimer and dementia. Uh, yeah, so pretty amazing. And then the alginates. Alginates, um, these are commonly used, like you are in contact with seaweed products every day of your life and probably you don't know it. Uh, alginates are used as emulsifiers. So everything that makes your sauce, if you buy a sauce or a soup or whatever uh, from food industry that has alginate. Dentists use it too. Uh, they use it to give this texture to jeans. The jeans are a little bit like rough. So that is also done with alginate. Uh, they are now developing uh, alternatives to fabrics made of seaweed. And that's also with the fiber generated by alginate. So alginate for me is like a big, big star uh, because it, it uh, touches a little bit of several industries. And then after that, uh, you can, there, there are many other things. You can do biofertilizer, soil improver, activated carbon. Uh, you can also do um, like a paper. Um, these are these are like I'm mentioning products that are out there already done by other startups in the Caribbean and in the US and in Mexico. 
and also um, this uh, bioconcrete uh, and construction blocks. So you name it. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's super interesting. Thank you. I had no idea. <laughs> That's awesome. I feel like we're still just touching the tip of the iceberg, too. <laughs> um, Jerry, would you like to unmute to ask your question? Hello. Um, oh, it's, it's hard to hear you. Hold on, try, try oh, again. There we go. Sorry, can you hear me now? All good. All good. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, is the vision behind the harvesting of the sargassum to work alongside the food additives that exist in the market, so uh, such as the red seed, um, or as an alternative to it? I think you answered part of that um, in your previous answer, but I would love to have you expand on that a little bit more. Um, and to follow up on Alexandra's question as well, who are the customers that you're seeing for your solution? Um, maybe I can take care of the biorefinery part and then Frude can explain a little bit about the customers and of course they have two sides. So with the microbiorefinery and other seaweeds in the, our current microbiorefinery pilot in Mexico, we're working only with sargasso and with microalgae, chlorella and spirulina mainly. Uh, but we're exploring uh, because other Caribbean countries, they grow uh, sea moss, which is a red algae. And there's a big demand for ink made of, uh, of seaweed uh, to dye clothes and so on in a more sustainable and uh, like eco-friendly way. So we are exploring uh, to, to do more R&D in other uh, native species so we can expand and, and have like more products available. And about the clients. Yeah, so the clients, <clears throat> It all depends on the country, really, uh, because the coastlines are some in some countries or islands. They are the the responsibility, you know, for the coastlines sometimes are the government. So you definitely need to go directly to the governments in order to uh, to to um, you know to to uh, well they they would be the one being pushed from the hotels, and the, uh, the marinas, and so on, in order to keep the the coastlines clean of sargassum but um in many cases the hotels they're doing this directly as well you know it this is a it's a complicated sit situation for a lot of the islands because the, the sargassum is coming and then there um and most of their income it comes from tourism that means if they just let this sargassum come the tourism or the tourists they go to other places where they where there is no sargassum so um, but then again, in order for them to uh, to remove this uh, this seaweed, or they actually need to take from budgets, they from other budgets in order to to clean it. You know, when this this sargassum is piling up every day, you know, you clean it, and the next day is another uh, meter, and another meter the next day. Uh, so many of these these islands are taking the the money from budgets from you know uh, the, the the education the health and so on. So it's becoming kind kind of this uh, evil little circle for them. Um, and this is also one of the reasons we want to create this new economy for them. Instead of looking at this orgasm as a problem, a garbage, it can actually be become the new Caribbean gold, as we like to call it. Uh, but yes, uh, clients uh, for the harvesting is definitely. In some countries, uh, it would be the government. In other countries, it's directly the hotels. They have the responsibility for the beaches themselves. And of course, the ports, the marinas, and so on. And then in the end, as uh, uh, Paulina touched, basically, uh, we have uh, the product line that is coming out. And then you have a, a wide range of, of clients uh, from there, basically. And then Abby and Bo, just curious to hear on your guys' end, you know, some of maybe, I mean, there's also a, a microalgae uh, that you guys are taking on, as well as, uh, you know, just some of the opportunities for customers. Curious to hear your guys' thoughts there, too. Our customer segments fall uh, roughly under four different categories. We have government bodies, uh, like different cities or like the city of Miami, perhaps, um, somewhere that's looking to assess their coastal ecosystems and how red tide or um, 
ecosystem health or runoff could be impacting their local coastlines and the ecosystem services that their coasts provide, uh, all the way up to federal agencies like NOAA or um, USGS who are interested in blue carbon mapping, monitoring, and ecosystem service assessments, um, as well as ESG impact. So that falls under companies that are looking to understand or monitor their environmental impact on the coastal ecosystems if they're um, affiliated with the coastal ecosystems and companies also that are monitoring ESG impact. Um, the data and insights could also be used for uh, tourism assessments, risk management, and insurance organizations that are looking to assess adverse effects of um, ecosystem health and um, citizen science and education. Anything else you like to add to that, Bill? I think she got it. It's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I think it's really, you know, when we talk about for both of these solutions, when we talk about the customer base, I think these are by definition emerging market, right? And so, you know, we're, we're, we're absolutely charting out like these are great potential customers, but we're literally proving these markets that historically in a lot of different places, a lot of countries are still just starting to take off. So um, I think it's a really interesting piece of this to say that it's not just about customers, but it's actually proving markets that, you know, are completely relatively new in the scheme of things, right? I mean, Abby, we were just saying yesterday, is not, not NAC, so the e, e, I'm, I'm learning a lot. This week. What was the term? Uh, EG, EN, ENGs? No. NACs uh, I, are a, an asset, an asset group that doesn't exist yet. So natural asset companies, which are, are going to be added to the New York Stock Exchange. So they don't exist yet. Uh, they just were announced in the last couple of weeks, which is a very exciting new avenue to take things. Yes, and, and it's also very hard to keep track of all the different acronyms that I keep learning. <laughs> anyway, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Sarah, would you like to unmute to ask your question? Sure, thanks, Daniel. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, um, so this question was for the Talasso team. So curious about your transformation step on that like broader timeline from beginning of sargasm to end products um, that you showed. What's your plan there for the transformation? Is it to sell the raw material necessarily to the manufacturers since there seem to be so many different um, end products that you could make? Or is it you'll be processing it into some different unit that you'll then sell? Um, I know you mentioned that you'd be charging on like uh, a sort of like square foot base, but curious how you'll be selling your raw product to the manufacturers. Yeah, I guess I, <laughs> so we have, um, this is very cool. We have, uh, we only need a thousand square meters to install the microbiome refinery, which is very, very small. And in the, this uh, facility, we can, we can create a, uh, um, we can do simultaneously three extractions. We have a patent for that, for Fukuida and Fukuxanthin and Alginate. And then same facility, we can make the biofertilizer and soil improver, and then the biomass is completely gone. Um, and yes, so we are in conversations right now uh, with the seaweed uh, industry is very like, they, they are very, they operate very secretly. And uh, so they have seaweed traders. And the seaweed traders, they, they sell both the ingredients to several industries, food industry, pharma industry, cosmetic industry, and fashion industry mainly. And, uh, and of course the biomass. And since we, our capacity to transform the biomass into these final extractions is still very small, we are as well uh, thinking about bailing the fruit. I can explain a little bit more about that and selling the biomass to bigger, bigger facilities. But ideally, we want to continue scaling the microbiome refineries so we don't have a big carbon footprint by transporting the seaweed to from one Caribbean country to probably an European country with a major capacity. Yeah, one of the uh, the um... How to say challenges, of course, with the seaweed is that it, 
after three hours, we, you, you should try to conserve it before three hours is gone. So in reality, uh, the goal is to, um, and you know, preserve, preserve it or dry it or do something with the, with the, with the sargassum as soon as possible when we get it. Uh, but of course, one of the, the ways we can do that is to bale it at sea or bale it quickly when it comes to shore. Um, and with the baling, you basically do what the farmers are doing. You know, you put, <laughs> you know, the seaweed in balls uh, and you remove the oxygen so you can actually uh, keep it and, and store it for a longer period of time. But again, this is this is something we, we still need to try out a bit more because uh, uh, one thing is to bale uh, hay uh, from uh, from the farm, and another thing is to to to, to bale uh, the seaweed that is coming straight from the sea, and it might have other uh, bacteria and other things there that could uh, in, you know potentially ruin the uh, the content of it. So, but at least that's kind of where we're aiming at when you have some testing and so on to to to, to figure out if if it's if it's doable. Um, uh, but yes, no, it's it's very interesting. Uh, we we even have uh, you know interest from uh, from wine, um, you know, vineyards in Italy, and uh, you know, all all kind of different kind of industries. They look at how how this could be used for different purposes. Well, and very I, I cool. want to add. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Nope, I'm just saying, super cool. Thank you. <laughs> but I, I was just going to add to your argument, guys. I just spoke to a company up in, in Boston or Connecticut, New England, um, yesterday or day before. Uh, and shout out to Willis at Drink Sea Green. And uh, they're actually combining kelp with like adaptogens to basically try to replace people's morning coffee with seaweed. So, all sorts of interesting cases to be made for these products. That was great. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll drink it. Um, then, then you make mixed drinks and have real fun with that. But uh, all that being said, um, I do want to wrap up with a uh, for fun question real quick to uh, to Clean Coast too, which is, you know, really when we, you know, we we've, I know Abby, you're, you're new to the fray still, but, you know, really gotten a thrown, thrown in head first and are thriving here. Um, you know, but when we, when we look at kind of just, you know, this whole month of our cohort, I've really just been inspired by a lot of the conversations we're having. And, you know, I would just, Throw to you guys to say, you know, what's kind of the biggest takeaway that you're you're seeing from just the emergence of these interdisciplinary teams and fields? Uh, I think you touched on it earlier, but just kind of that as a trend uh, for people thinking about taking the leap here. It's about time. I am so excited to see it. Uh, it really takes these interdisciplinary teams. Like I've touched on, nobody can do anything in a silo, and we need these diverse perspectives to get to the bottom of the solutions we need to address our environmental crises. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I, I think I'd love that as kind of just a point to wrap, and especially after a whole month of these panels, thank you all for, for sticking through for four weeks in a row. I know four hours of Zoom seems brutal, but I think we do a good job of making it pretty painless, hopefully. All that being said, I want to throw it over to Stephanie, who's our development director, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the new collaborations we have going on that are serving our startups and future cohorts. Stephanie? Thank you, Daniel. And um, I'm just going to extend another thank you to all of you for being here. Um, and if you've made it to all four weeks of these events, we appreciate you. Um, I know it's been long, but you know all of these startups are, are super cool and we're very proud of them and we are so happy to present them all to you. Um, but right now I just wanna quickly touch on um, another group of people that we're excited to be partnered with. And so we wanna just celebrate our partnership with our friends over at Open Grants. Open Grants is a grant search engine and marketplace of independent grant consultants. You can find grants on your own, hire an expert to help you search, apply for, and manage your grant. So they are empowering startups, nonprofits, grant writers, foundations, and government agencies to participate in a new paradigm of funding. You can sign up for free and search at Open Grants. Thanks. Wow, oh, that was that was really well. Like man, I, I want that announcer voice skill. Um, all that being said, I'm going to do the much for, very formal rundown on seaworthy side of things. Um, by giving by screen sharing our website and just running you guys through some of the opportunities that we have going on real quick coming up. So tomorrow, if you haven't heard, we have Venture Cafe uh, 
here in Miami in person hybrid. And a lot of these guys that you've seen all month are actually going to be going back over their uh, elevator pitches tomorrow. So it's, uh, we'll put the link in the chat for you guys. So if you're able to make it, uh, we'll be here tomorrow and be celebrating our one year anniversary since launch as well. So please join us. All the links to sign up are right here on that late on that page. And then otherwise, just to review, um, if you haven't seen before the startup stage to learn more about all these amazing startups, you can go here and you can see both Clean Coast and Sea Green, who are co-created startups, as well as the Lasso, who's a crowdsource startup. And then otherwise, if you want to apply for our next cohort, just click the O4SC link, which is short for Opportunities for Sea Change, and you can click Apply, and all the stuff is right there for you. It takes like five minutes or less. Actually, I would say three minutes or less, unless you're a really slow typer. And then last but not least, if you want to watch the recordings of these events, we're actually, we post all the recordings of our events on the events tab. So you can watch them back and other and watch all my bad jokes. Um, and then last but not least, if you're interested in sponsorship and partnership opportunities, that's on the sponsors and partners tab here as well. So hopefully my website tour didn't keep you, bore you guys too much, but really appreciate everyone's time today. Thanks again to Paulina, Freude, Abby, and Bo. Really appreciated all of your input. Uh, there is a ton in the chat there for how to follow us. And hopefully by now you're following all of our stuff, but if not, Make sure to. And last but not least, I actually have a special reminder from Alexandra that it is National Women's Business Day, or no, National Business Women's Day. And, uh, and I thought it's quite appropriate since we have two female founders here. Power to the ladies. Love it. Uh, so thank you guys. Uh, and really excited to see uh, you all next month as we have our end of cohort pitch showcase uh, venue pending for October 20th. So we will keep you posted as soon as we have that announcement out there. But for now, thank you guys all so much, and we will see you in October. Or actually, no, we'll see you tomorrow for Venture Cafe in October. <laughs> thank you see so you much. <laughs> thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.